<laughs> I am very nervous. The song is He Calms Me, and right now I really need his calming. <laughs> Aren't you thankful for that calm that he gives us, even in the midst of our storms? Even when they're raging, there can be a calm within our soul. Praise the Lord. Sister Debbie says it's been a while since she's been up here. She took a few weeks to go visit her grandbaby. So that's why she has that permanent smile on her face here lately. Amen. She spent time with those grandbabies. I know she enjoyed that. I want to turn this morning to the book of Acts chapter 2. Book of Acts chapter 2. I'm going to read one verse for a text, and then we'll get a little deeper into that in a few moments. But uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 16. I would tell you I won't hold you long, but you know it's going to be an hour. So uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 16. Noah just called me back there to make sure that I got my text right. So, yeah, I got it right. This is, this is the text. Acts 2, 16 says, This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Actually, the might be seem like a short verse, but what I really needed was just the first word, this, this. As we look in deeper into this word this morning, pray God to add his blessing unto his word this morning. So stretch your hands towards heaven. Let's ask God to speak to us today. Father, I'm thankful today for your spirit, for your power, for your presence. And Lord, I depend completely upon the anointing this morning, Lord. For it's your anointing that is the difference. It's your anointing that breaks the yoke. It's your anointing that we desperately need in this hour that we live in. 
And I just ask you, Father God, to add unto your servant your anointing today. And add unto your servants the hearts and the anointing that they need to receive your word in good ground. We praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. We read on in verse 17 what he's talking about. And also found in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. But he goes on to say, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my Spirit. I will pour out in those days of my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned in the darkness and the moon in the blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. As they came out of that upper room, And we know what happened in that upper room. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind. They were all filled with the promise of the Father, filled with the Holy Ghost. Began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. Came out of that upper room into the streets. And as they came into the streets, there was a great gathering of all nations there. And they all heard them uh, singing forth and praising and worshiping God. Uh, And they understood them in their own language. Uh, And they looked at them strangely. And Peter said, said, these are not drunk, uh, as you suppose. Uh, But he said, this is that. Uh, And then he went on to explain what this is. Uh, In in short, uh, I know there's a long prophecy there that Joel, uh, that he shared from Joel, uh, but he said there in verse 17, uh, and I will pour out my spirit uh, upon all flesh. Uh, He said it again in verse 18, I will pour out in those days of my spirit. Uh, And then finally, the end result of God pouring out his spirit, he said, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And understand what he's talking about there, what this is. It's a pouring out of God's Spirit. It is the answer to what they were looking for. As they gathered there on that mountainside after Jesus was taken, He appeared before them again before He left and said, Go to Jerusalem and tarry there because when you you tarry there, you're going to receive uh, the promise of my Father. Uh, he said, you shall be endued with power uh, from on high. Uh, so in our text this morning, uh, what is this? Well, Peter said, this is that uh, which was spoken uh, by the prophet Joel. And as we go back, uh, we didn't have to flip back in Scripture uh, because Peter shared it with us. But if we flip back uh, in Scripture, you can find uh, the very same thing uh, in Joel 2, 28 through 32, uh, and what this is, uh, is God's Spirit being poured out on man. And so I wanted to give you a foundation, an explanation uh, of how a pastor could get excited over such a word as this. This. I am so excited about the word uh, this. The title of my message this morning is, I live for this. I live for this. And this, as we have found, and I gave you a short explanation of what this is. This is an outpouring of the Spirit of God. I'm living for an outpouring of the Spirit of God. Why are you living for that, Pastor? Because he said when that happens, that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I don't know what you're living for this morning. Too many people People are living for so many things. But Peter stood there and said, can I tell you what this is? This is that. What was he saying? He said, it's not just confound to our day, not just confound to the book of Acts, not just confound to the New Testament. He said, but this is that. It was already spoken of men of old, such as Joel, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is his spirit. 
Spirit. This is his power. This is his authority. This is his anointing. This is that, he said. And so we've got to get to that place that we have a longing and a yearning, yes, for that. Oh, but I want the church of God in Middleburg to get on fire this morning and say, I've got a longing and a yearning for this, for an outpouring of the Spirit of God because this is where the answer is at. He said, it's here that I'll command my blessing. It's here that I'll pour out my Spirit. We've alluded to this verse several times over the last few weeks, but Galatians 2 and 20, Paul's put it so wonderfully of how a Christian life should be. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Get this. Remember my title, I live for this. The life that which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If you put a title on Galatians 2 and 20, you know what it would be. I live for this. I live for this. We read on in the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul writing again to another church in 2 Corinthians 6 and 20. He said, For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Understand something this morning. We are made up of body and spirit. And too many people want to separate the two uh, and say, I can do whatever I want to in this body, with this body, act however I want with this body, go wherever I want with this body. Uh, But understand what Paul wrote here uh, and what he put out. Understand uh, that your body does not belong to you. Uh, If you've been born again and sold out to God, has been bought with a price. Uh, Therefore, he said, glorify God in your body. Uh, But he went on to say, and in your spirit. So we can't just be spiritual on Sunday. I don't know how many came up 16 uh, to church this morning from Penny Farms area, but I just happened to glance over at the church sign at one of the churches there, and it said uh, uh, something to the essence is you can't expect to be in spiritual shape if you only work out on Sundays. And we, we have that expectation of, of getting something. Uh, he's saying here, glorify God. What is he saying? He's saying you've got to live for this. Uh, you've got to live for this. Uh, what are we living for? What, what is the, the purpose of our lives? And what are we uh, understanding and our understanding uh, of the Scriptures? Uh, well, Paul shared this uh, last Sunday night, and I've got it in my notes uh, this morning from Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 12. 12 through 14, uh, just to reemphasize. Uh, I'd already had it in my notes, but it's a reemphasize because he said it first. Uh, but therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. We don't have to do what the flesh wants to do, is what he's saying. We have to, we cannot live for this. We got to live for this. We can't just live for this and what this wants to do. uh, Because uh, if you live for what this wants to do, you'll find yourself uh, in some tough situations. Uh, He went on to say in verse 13, uh, For if you live after the flesh, I just put it in modern terms, you're going to die. He said, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do Mortify, And Paul broke down what that word mortify means to us. Destroy, kill, slaughter. To to mortify is destruction. Uh, He said, if you through the Spirit uh, do mortify the deeds of the body, uh, you shall live. Uh, It's not talking about having a little bit of a spiritual life, a little bit of religion, uh, a little touch. Uh, 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 Sister Susie Thomas preached years ago. uh, She came to our church. She said, a little dab won't do. Uh, You're going to need more than a little dab. Uh, And understand something, what he's saying here. uh, He's saying, but if you through the Spirit uh, do mortify the deeds of the body, uh, you shall 
shall live. Do you have enough of this uh, abiding and living and abounding in your life uh, that is mortifying the deeds of the flesh? Uh, if not, we need to do a checkup. Uh, if this has not been poured, he said, I will pour out my spirit. And when I do, uh, there's going to be prophesying. Uh, there's going to be worshiping. Uh, there's going to be soul saved. Uh, when this comes, when this moves, when this happens, uh, when this takes place, uh, we're going to see a mortifying of the deeds of the flesh. Uh, he said that that will take place. Uh, he said in verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. I live for this. I'm being led by this. I am being led by this. What is this? When, when, you say, when somebody says, I live for this, you're expecting them to show you something physical. And understand that the, the showing you something physical has to be in the life that I live every day. Because I can preach something to you on Sunday morning, but live something different in front of you on Monday morning. And that's contrary to the Word of God. So what Paul is telling us here uh, is we've got to have so much of this, the Spirit. Uh, we've got to have so, so understand when I'm talking about this this morning, I'm talking about the Spirit of God. I live for the Spirit of God. I, I live for this. So we, he said, you've got to have so much of the Spirit of God in your life that it mortifies the deeds of the flesh. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, he said, well, in another place, Paul read it last Sunday night, uh, that it's enmity. It's enmity against the flesh. It's an enemy. Uh, there's spirit. There is a war that goes on inside of us every day. Why? Because the flesh wants to go over here uh, and do these things. Uh, but the spiritual man saying, no, I want more of this. Uh, I want what I read in Acts 2. I want what I read in Joel 2. Uh, I want to read uh, what I read throughout the Word of God. Uh, we get up this in the mornings uh, and we have our morning devotionals, or we should, uh, and we spend time talking to God, uh, and we spend time in communion with God. We begin to read the Word of God. We begin to, to read a devotional. Maybe you pick up your devotional book that Brother Hanks wrote and you're reading that devotional this morning about it's our responsibility to fight off the buzzards, the enemy that's trying to come against our children and trying to come against the rock which is Christ Jesus and we're looking for revival and we read that and we understand that the only way that we're going to have that outpouring of the Spirit and it said that he, that he shook off we read in the devotional this morning that she kept waving off uh, the buzzards. We also find this about Abraham, uh, that he did the same thing, keeping the buzzards away. Uh, but what was she waiting for? Uh, she was waiting on the rain to fall. Uh, and what does that rain represent? Uh, it represents this. Uh, it represents the outpouring uh, of the Spirit of God. You might have to fight off the buzzards of the flesh, uh, but keep fighting off the buzzards of the flesh uh, until this uh, is living fresh and new in your life. Uh, so you get up in the morning and you, you read that and you spend time with God. Then you step out the door. And the flesh says, I want to go this way. After the things of the world, I want to go and do all these things. But your spiritual man has been fed and been in communion with the Spirit. Say, no, 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 I want this. The flesh says, I want to live this way. But something happened deep down inside of you when you were born again. It says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I've bought with a price, so I don't want to go there. I don't want to live like that. I want to live like this. I want to live like this. I want to live like the Spirit says live. Because we find when we live like the Spirit says live, the people that were in the same position that I was in, in the foyer, you'll see or Sister Amanda calls it the vestibule. You'll see a bridge that Brother Paul put together for me for pastor appreciation. It's a representation of what we're talking about there in this year of restoration. That on one side of that bridge, you'll find those that are lost and in sin. And in that same place that you were in, I'm so glad that there was a whole gospel that was preached that, that I could come to the other side of that bridge uh, and find paths to dwell in. But now I have a responsibility. Uh, I don't know about you, but since I've born, been born again, uh, there's been planks that the devil's removed uh, from that bridge. They still talk about faith, but it was not the same faith. Uh, they talk about prayer, but it's not the same kind of diligence and fervency. Uh, they talk about a lot of the same things, but it just does not fit in that bridge. So it's up to you and I to live in such a way that we say this is not a counterfeit of this. This is not a replica of this. This is not just a demonstration of this. But they need to be able to look at us and look at you and me and say, and we can say this is that. 
No, I'm trying to be the very best this that I can be. Oh, no, that we find the Spirit of God abiding and abounding. So, so we come out, and flesh wants to go and live that way. The Spirit said, no, I live for this. You've got to remind the flesh that every day. Paul said, I die daily, talking about the flesh. Jesus said, you must take up your cross daily in the book of Luke. He said, daily and follow him. So it's a daily decision that we have to make. And so we find in 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians, excuse me, chapter 5, verse 13 through 15, for whosoever, for whether, excuse me, for whether we be beside ourselves, it's to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Listen to verse 15. And he died for all. Why did he die for all? Why did Jesus die for all? That they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. Jesus did not die for us to live for ourselves. Jesus did not die for us to do whatever we want to do, act however we want to talk, talk like we want to talk, be what we want to be. He said, but unto him which died for them and rose again. We should be living for this. And what is this? It's the Spirit of God. He said that we should do that. But understand, as I said, it's a daily decision. It's a daily decision that we step out. I'm speaking metaphorically when I say that we step out our front door. We may never step out the front door. Many people are working from home, doing school from home, and just staying in the house. But you still step out the front door. Whether you step in the door of your office there on the job, or you step in the door of your office through Zoom meetings or however you get there, uh, we're stepping across a threshold uh, and we're going to live one way or another. Uh, They're they're going to see some reflection of something. Uh, And I'm telling you, uh, I don't want them to see Jamie Wyatt because there's nothing impressive uh, about Jamie Wyatt. Uh, I don't want them to see uh, any ability or talent uh, or anything that I have uh, because everything uh, good in me uh, is of Jesus Christ. And some people have preached it and said it to be so. Just don't look at me. I just choose rather to kill flesh so you cannot look at me. He said, this life that I now live is no longer I, but Christ that lives in me. The flesh wants to be exalted. The flesh wants to make the decisions. But every day we've got to determine, no, I live for this. But it happens day by day. We was at a youth meeting yesterday in Baldwin. And Brother Elijah preached. He always does a wonderful job. And he was all over a message that I'm preparing for next Sunday. And I was very tempted to preach it this Sunday after he got through. Because he used even some of the same verses that I'll be using. God gave it to me last Wednesday night. It's just kneeling there at the altar. And I went home. And and I've got a lot of scriptures for next week. So I'm going to try to keep it short. But he began to to talk about the pool. He talked about the prodigal son. I'm not preaching on the prodigal son next Sunday, but he was preaching on the prodigal son and talking about the pool of this world. And he made a statement in there. The young people that were there may uh, remember what Brother Elias just said yesterday. He said, people don't backslide overnight. People don't backslide overnight. They don't go back completely to this world. But maybe today they decide, okay, flesh, we'll go do what you want to do. Right? But then the next day they they got it together. It's Sunday. I got it together. I came to church. I felt some goosebumps. I feel good. I'm ready. And then they go Monday. Maybe they go Tuesday and then Wednesday. They're like, okay, we'll do this. And they began to do it. Well, Casting Crowns wrote a song. And I've not heard this song in a long time, but I was working out the other day and came through my earbuds as I was working out and it was already in my notes for this morning but I have not heard it in, in, in a long time but listen to these words it says be careful little eyes what you see it's the second glance that ties your hands as darkness pulls the strings be careful little feet where you go for it's the little feet behind you that are sure to follow. 
It's a slow fade when you give yourself away. It's a slow fade when black and white are turned to gray. What powerful words in a song. Thoughts invade. Choices are made. Get this, a price will be paid when you give yourself away. My God. People never crumble in a day. It's a slow fade. It's a slow fade. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. When flattering leads to compromises, the end is always near. Be careful, little lips, what you say. For empty words and promises leave broken hearts astray. It's a slow fade when you give yourself away. It's a slow fade when black and white are turned to gray and thoughts invade. Choices are made. A price will be paid. When you give yourself away, people never crumble in a day. It's a slow fade. Get this, the journey from your mind to your hands is shorter than your thinking. Let me read that again. The journey from your mind to your hands is shorter than your thinking. That's why it's important that we have this mind in us, which is in Christ Jesus. Be careful if you think you stand. You just might be sinking. It's a slow fade when you give yourself away. It's a slow fade when black and white are turned to gray and thoughts invade. Choices are made. A price will be paid when you give yourself away. Oh, it's a slow fade away from living for this. People get fired up. Right? We go out of that hall, we're fired up. I'm living now for Jesus, and I'm happy now to say. We begin to sing, I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way. We've all been there. We've been there on fire for the Lord, rejoicing for the Lord. Many of you sitting here, I've, I've pastored you for a long time, and I've had encounters with you. I, I've seen you fired up, and I've seen you almost to the point that you couldn't get one foot in front of the other. Uh, why? Because thoughts invade. Uh, understand something. Black and white uh, turn to gray. Choices are made. Uh, we understand, though, when that happens, that there's a price uh, that will be paid when we determine uh, what we're going to do. It's a slow fade. It's the choices. Uh, Listen, we've got a choice uh, of what we're going to do in this thing. So many people uh, want to leave it as uh, the the cross was being the choice that uh, Jesus made, and then we have no choice in the matter. Uh, From there on out, it's done. Uh, But can I tell you that as long as we live uh, in this world, as long uh, as we live in this life, we have to make a choice uh, every day, every day, to live for this. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. I've had to remind myself of that often. Be careful eyes, what you see. Be careful ears, what you listen to. You you see what what he is talking about there, something that I've talked about for several weeks now, the senses. We depend too much on what we see, what we hear, what we taste. If it tastes good, it's got to be good. If it looks good, it's got to be good. If it sounds good, it's got to be good. No, it don't. It's a slow fade. The lines are blurred. It's a slow fade. And, and so we understand uh, that this, uh, this, the Spirit of God, this, the outpouring of a Spirit, this, the Word of God, uh, this, uh, the, the importance of what they experienced there in that upper room that didn't stay in the upper room. Uh, why did it go out uh, from that upper room? It wasn't just because they experienced this. I want you to get a hold of this now. The 120 in an upper room, they experienced this. We can experience a lot within the walls of this church. Camp meeting was wonderful this year. We experienced a lot within the walls of this church. But how, many, how much of this that we experienced in camp meeting? We could look at camp meeting and say, man, this is good. How many during camp meeting said that? Man, this is good. But how much of this have we seen in a daily basis? Has, has those who were not in camp meeting, those who have not opened their Bible, those who have not listened to Christian radio, uh, those that are not concerned with the things of God whatsoever, how much of this have they seen? 
How much of this that was so great and so grand and so wonderful that when we pick up our Bible in the morning with tears in our eyes, man, this is good. This is speaking to my heart. But how many of the people that we encounter on a daily basis do they get to experience this? We wipe the tears from our eyes and we go about our day uh, and we keep doing whatever we want to do. Uh, That's not what God intended for us to do. Uh, He said, we've got to live uh, for this. Uh, So what are you saying? I'm saying if this has touched your life, uh, he said, go out and be light and darkness. Uh, I've been reminded of something over and over and over again over the last several days, possibly weeks. Uh, Light shines brightest in darkness. So don't worry about the fact that it's getting dark around you if you are the light of the world. We have nothing to be concerned about uh, if our lamps are trimmed and brightly burning. Uh, The worry kicks in. The anxiety kicks in. uh, The frustration kicks in uh, when we're uncertain about the wick. When we're uncertain about where we are, listen, we get concerned about where we are when we know what we've been living for. But when we make up our mind on a daily basis that we get up in the morning and say, I'm living for this. When we get in that prayer closet and saying this, is not just an experience that I need. So understand that upper room was an experience that could not be contained in the upper room. They came out of the upper room down into the streets. And it was just what he said. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Not only was it his pouring out his spirit, but what did the last verse say? I don't have it in my, this part of my notes, so I'm backing up. The last verse, verse 21, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So what happened? Peter began to preach that three-minute sermon, some call it. And after he did, 3,000 souls were saved. When you live for this, when this is that... When this is not something uh, that had to be counterfeited, uh, had to be worked up, had to be made up, uh, but when it's the genuine gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, he said that souls are going to be saved. Lives are going to be touched and going to be moved upon. And so they carried it. It was not just an experience. It became a lifestyle. Because not only were 3,000 saved, but it went on to say that daily, daily, Souls were added to the church as they were breaking bread and as they were going from house to house. What was they doing? As they were living it. Why are souls not being saved? Why were souls being saved during that time? Because they were living for this. The only way that souls are going to be saved in our day is if we're living for this. Living for the Spirit. Living for the outpour. Hungry and yearning. Those that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. And so in closing this morning, we say we're living for Christ. We say that we're living for Christ, yet we still allow the flesh to call the shots. Don't start the music just yet, Noah, because that's just my first closing. We pray if the flesh feels like praying. We attend church if the flesh has time. We give to ministry if the flesh determines that we don't need those funds for something else. We can go on and on and on. When we bear those thoughts in mind, what are we living for if that's the way we're living? What are we living for if that's the way that we're living? You know what that is? That's a slow fade. Choices are being made. A tug of war that is taking place. The time of Jesus standing there uh, and they were going to release him. They said, we don't want him. Uh, well, what do you want me to do? Uh, I, he, he can't, he, I find no guilt of him. Pilate said, I don't see any reason for him even to be here. And what did they say? They, he said, there's only one other option. I can release a prisoner unto you. He said, What did he do? He gave them a choice. He gave them a choice. He said, here's Jesus. But then they also had a notable prisoner by the name of Barabbas. And Barabbas represented, he was a murderer. 
That was his charges. He was a murderer. He, he was all, everything that he was accused of, he was guilty. And as he stood there, what Barabbas represents is us. It represents the flesh. I don't have to tell you what Jesus represents. We know he is what he is. He is I am. And so standing, he said, I've got before you Jesus and Barabbas. And, and we, we look at this answer and we're like, what's wrong with those people? Give us Barabbas. What were they saying? Release Barabbas unto us. Let Barabbas hang around our kids. Let Barabbas live next door to us. Let Barabbas sleep in our spare bedroom. Let Barabbas eat dinner with us. Let Barabbas be. We want Barabbas in our life. Okay, if I give you Barabbas, what do you want me to do with Jesus? What did they say? Crucify him. We look back at that scene and we think how awful it was, but we understand that that's what had to happen for you and I to even come to where we are today as born-again believers. Uh, And we look at this and we say, how could they choose Barabbas uh, over Jesus? But every day we choose the flesh over the Spirit. So understand when we keep choosing Barabbas and keep choosing the flesh and keep choosing uh, to feed the flesh and live after the flesh, uh, there comes a decision uh, that God the Father is saying, I sent my Son to die for your sin. And understand this, that Jesus said, it's expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter cannot come. He said they were there in the upper room for the promise of the Father, which is the Holy Ghost, the third person of the Godhead. So God's got this great plan. Jesus died for our sin. Holy Ghost has been sent as our Comforter. And to be with us, He said, you shall receive power. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So now we're kind of in that same scene. But it's not Pilate asking the questions. But it's God the Father saying, I stand before you today, Jesus and the Holy Ghost. I have placed both of them in this earth for you. We find in the New Testament, He placed Jesus uh, in our day. uh, The Holy Ghost is here. We know Jesus is back at the right hand of the Father. Stephen witnessed to that account. uh, And now the Holy Ghost is here with us. uh, And the Lord said, I've created this uh, great plan to get you from uh, where you are to where I am. I am pouring out my Spirit. I have a plan uh, to pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. So standing before you today is Jesus and Barabbas, the Spirit and the flesh. They screamed out, give us Barabbas. We respond a little differently today. Oh, I don't want to make a decision. Well, we don't say that, Pastor. No, we live that. We live indecisive. I want both. You can't have both. Death to the flesh is what Paul preached last Sunday night. You can't have both. Oh, well, let, let's ask the question again. I put before you, which do you choose? Which do you choose? And through our actions, we have said, give us Barabbas. Remember the next question? What I do with Jesus? Crucify him. He'll never be crucified again. I miss Brother Ronnie used to sing this song, and I never understood exactly what this song was saying. I get the point of it, though, now. He said, does he still feel the nails every time I fail? Does he still feel the nails every time I make that choice? Why? Because when they chose Barabbas over Jesus, they're saying crucify him. And Paul I believe it's Paul, maybe Peter, that says, talks about that, crucifying Christ afresh by our choices. Choices made. But understand, when choices are made, a price will be paid. So in real closing this morning, you can start whatever you usually start. How much in your life would be different if you stop professing salvation. Preacher friend of mine said, 
I can't even imagine backsliding. I'd have to get a whole new set of friends. Couldn't imagine backsliding. I'd have to get a whole new daily routine. Couldn't imagine backsliding. I wouldn't have nowhere to go three times a week. I couldn't imagine backsliding. I'd have to find new things to read. Somebody else to talk to in the early morning hours. Couldn't imagine backsliding. But when you begin to evaluate your life, listen, I'm telling you right now, I live for this. I live for this. And I'm right there with my preacher friend. If I stop professing salvation, if I stop living for this, one songwriter said, he's the only reason I live. But oh, what a reason. But I'm not talking about me this morning. I'm wanting you to ask yourself this question as you stand with me. How much would my life be different if I stopped professing salvation? We don't have a video going this morning, so with every head bowed and every eye closed, nobody looking around this morning. I don't do this very often. But with that question in mind, asking yourself that question, ask yourself again, how much in my life would be different if I gave up, if I stopped professing salvation. Is there anybody here who would lift their hand this morning and say, not much? Just on his hearts this morning. If I was not to profess my salvation no longer after today, not much would change in my life. Who would be honest? Lift your hand. God sees that hand this morning. God sees that hand this morning. Anyone else? Every head bow, boys. Eyes closed, please. Very important moment, personal moment for people. If I stop living for the Lord, if I determine I'm not going to do it anymore, how much would really change? Some hands went up. Can I tell you, if your hand went up and you said not much, it's time to make some changes. Because it's a slow fade. If not much, we're changing your daily routine. There's a slow fade that's happening. Some were honest. They lifted their hand. Some were reluctant, but they know they needed to lift their hand. Some may even be listening. It's got their hand up. But if not much would change, that means that you're not necessarily... 100% completely living for this. This has been, been our scripture again here lately. It seems like our go-to and been heavy upon us even more so because it's so important. Romans 12, 1 and 2. If you raised your hand or if you knew you needed to raise your hand, you need to hear these words. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I'm leaving you with a choice. This message today is leaving each one of us with a choice. What are we living for? What are we living for? Who are we living for? Is it for you? The decisions you make is what's best for you? Paul said, when you come to the place that you're totally surrendered to Him, it's for the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When we start living for this, it's going to be all about the kingdom. If everything that you do is not all about the kingdom, we need to pray this morning. I want to give a general altar call. I want everyone to come and find them a place in this altar this morning. And why don't you talk to the Lord for, about what you're living for. And get to that place before you leave this altar to know that you know that you know, I live for this. I live for His Spirit, His presence. Father God, as we approach this altar this morning, I ask, Lord God, that you give an earnest desire to rise up within the heart of every believer this morning to say, I cannot swiftly or slowly fade away from you. We know that when we're fading, we know when our interest is being drawn this way or that way. 
We know that we're appeasing the flesh and not paying any attention to the things of the Spirit. Some are slowly fading away as they give themselves away. But Lord God, I pray that you'd rescue them, restore them this morning. They come back into that right relationship with you. Meet with us around these altars this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name.